Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. It's my great honor to be here today. My topic is, is Made in Africa possible? So I want to talk about first why we should talk about Made in Africa. And secondly, we talk about can Africa made it. And the last thing I want to talk about entrepreneurship. First, why should we talk about manufacturing Made in Africa? Why should we do that? I will start with 2015 is a historical year for the United Nations. As we all know, all the countries around the world adopt a new set of goals to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure prosperity for all, which is embark a new journey to improve the lives of people everywhere. But the question is, in the next 15 years with this SDG, can we really achieve it? Before we answer that question, I would like to say, let's look at of some of the figures in the past. From year 1950 to 2008, globally, there's about 200 developing economies. But in reality, only two economies moved from lower income status to higher income status in our human history in those 70 years. That is South Korea and, tai and, and, and Taiwan, and China likely to be the third one by 2025. And out of those 200 developing economies, only 13 of them actually moved from middle income status to higher income status. Out of those 13 economies, eight of them are in Europe. The other five are the Asia Four Tigers plus Japan. Despite trillions of money has been plugged, plugged into Africa in our human history in the past 70 years. You know, most of the countries are still trapped in poverty. So what went wrong? And then if we are talking about in the next 15 years, we are going to change it dramatically, would it really going to happen? So today, actually, I would say actually I'm optimistic of that. Why? Because number one, job creation has been the key for poverty reduction in Asia. And secondly, how would those poor countries, Japan, Asia for Tigers, and China, was able to create so many jobs? The secret, actually, because in the 60s and 80s, during the industrialization relocation, those countries captured the golden opportunity. They were able to create millions of jobs for the people in the bottom of the pyramid. And that is the jump start of those countries' economic transformation. You know, today, standing here as a Chinese, I'm very proud. Why? Because my generation in China witnessed 680 million people has been lifted out the international poverty line. And that's nothing to do with aid. It's all about the job creation in China. And today, not only about the, uh, the job creation, you know, we also know the statistics from the World Bank, the number of people living under the international poverty line in the world since 1960 to today. If we exclude the 680 million people in China, that number actually didn't decline. So there actually has been some fundamental flaws towards the traditional developing models which actually has been imposed to Africa, which Asia has been taken a very different kind of approach. Because why? Because it's a common consensus. In the 50s and 60s, some of you probably well, it's very known, Africa has a much better chance for economic transformation. Asia is a hopeless continent, but the reality today is very different. And the very important key, as I mentioned, job creation, and actually the industrialization relocation. And that's the jump start of those countries' economic transformation. Because I said earlier, I'm very optimistic in Africa. Why? Because today, there's a golden opportunity. What is that? The GDP per capita in the year I was born, 1978, in China, is only 154 US dollars, which is less than one third of the sub-Saharan African countries. And the GDP per capita in China in 2015 is 7,500. And according to China, China is going to double that by 2025. That means by 2025, China is going to become a high-income country. That also means the golden opportunity after 30 years golden manufacturing in China is happening again. And this time, it's a golden opportunity for a lot of other developing countries. So there's a... Why? Because all those labor-intensive jobs have to be relocated out of China by 2025 because China is going to become a high-income country. But this round of relocation is far more complicated compared what, with what happened in the 60s and in the 80s. Why? The scale. In the 60s, when Japan was relocating, they only relocate 9.7 million jobs. And then in the 80s, when Korea was relocating, they only relocate 2.3 million jobs. 
This round, how many jobs Chinese in the process of relocating have a guess? 85 million jobs. China is relocating. So if actually, and Southeast Asia don't have enough population to absorb all those 85 million jobs. And that is the golden opportunity for Africa because Africa is a continent of 1.2 billion population. Most of them are young people desperate for jobs. If they can capture this round of the relocation, that means some of the country can have the same economic transformation like China, Asia in the next 30 years. But some of you might say, Helen, this is all in theory. This is not going to happen because this and that. But I want, the second thing I want to tell you, this actually has already happened. There's an industrialization movement has already started in Africa. I came to Ethiopia back in 2011 to set up a shoe factory. It took me three months from design to investment to actual produce from Ethiopia to the US market in the following three months. And then, after, and then in the next six months, I doubled the export revenue in Ethiopia. By the end of year one, I recruited 2,000 local workers. By the end of year two, I recruited 4,000 local workers. Ethiopia ranked 125, according to World Bank Doing Business Report. Nobody believed Africa, Ethiopia is ready to be in the global value chain to be able to produce product for the, globe, for the shoes, you know, clothes for the US market back in 2011. And at the same time, you're probably wondering, you probably want to ask me, Helen, out of the world, why did you pick Ethiopia? The answer is, I did not pick Ethiopia. It was Ethiopia who picked me. The story started in March 2011, when the late Prime Minister Meles had a meeting with Professor Justin Lin, the former chief economist of the World Bank. And he asked Justin's advice in terms of poverty reduction and economic transformation. And basically, Justin told him about these 85 million jobs are in the process of relocating out of China. The prime minister is very smart. He said, tell me how. How am I going to capture this opportunity? Exactly. So as a remedy, Professor Lin told him, he said, in order to capture this, you know, you need to create a quick, successful examples. Because of quick, successful examples will bring the inspiration, leadership, confidence, and experience to your country and to the continent. So six months later, the prime minister himself went to China, he invited a group of investors, and I was among them. That is how the shoe factory started. And after I created 4,000 jobs, unfortunately, the late prime minister passed away. And the new prime minister, which is the current one, uh, Haile Maran, took on his place. And then in July 2013, on his first official visit to China, he invited me to travel with him on the private jet, and he asked me to sit next to him. On the plane, he said, he said, Helen, I really appreciate you. You know, you set up a great manufacturing story for my country. But for the real industrialization to come, I need thousands, you know, of the company you created. Can you help me to do that? Clearly, I said the answer is yes. So I left the shoe factory. In 2013, I became the first Chinese advisor to the Ethiopian government. My first task, actually, is to promote the first government-owned industrial park called Boli Laming in Addis Ababa. It took, in the past five years, the government struggled five years to attract residents you know, of the park. Why I took on these jobs? It took me three months without any international advertisement. All 22 factory units, we leased it out all of them to international manufacturers from Turkey, India, Bangladesh, China, all over the world. How did we do it? Very simple. Success brings success. I invited investors in, showed them the 4,000 jobs I created. Most importantly, I showed them the profit and loss account. They just signed the lease immediately. And it is because of success. At the same year, we convinced the World Bank, first time in their history, to give 200 million US dollars, you know, as a zero interest loan, you know, to government to develop the second phase of the industrial park. And then I set up the Made in Africa initiative with the support of the UN in 2014. And then we have been helping Ethiopian government building another 10 industrial parks. Today, the latest industrial park called Havasa Park is 100% for textile and, uh, and garments, and 100% for export, and it's going to generate 60,000 jobs and 1 billion export revenue. It took Ethiopia six years from nobody even believing it as a landlocked country, and now becoming, if you Google it, you can see Ethiopia is the next manufacturing floor. And Ethiopia's story had a big snowballing effect in the African continent. I was being invited by the president of uh, Rwanda, so I set up the first garment factory down there two years ago. 
Rwanda is a small landlocked country. Nobody believes manufacturing is possible. We are taking cottons from Burundi. We are taking textile from Uganda. Through industrialization, we are making exports, you know, to the U.S. market. So we are creating jobs. We are also making Rwanda from a landlocked country to a land-connect country. And then uh, two years ago, I'm also being invited by the president of Senegal. So we helped the government create the first industrial park. And currently, under the Made in Africa initiative, I'm advising eight African head of states on their industrialization strategy. That's why I'm saying, you know, there's an industrialization movement has already started. Now I want to talk about a little bit of entrepreneurship. Actually, what a, how, how to make things happen. If you ask me, do you is, is doing manufacturing very easy in Africa? The answer is no, not really. When I came to Ethiopia, I met the prime minister and the ministers. They told me, Helen, you are doing 100% export. All your raw material will be tax-free. But in reality, it is not the prime minister or minister sitting at the port clearing my goods. I have the brush to brush the shoes. They said, this is the brush to brush human teeth. You need to be taxed. I have a machine to make a hole in the lady's shoes. They said, looks like a weapon. It you can, it's illegal, you cannot even get cleared into the customer. So what I have to do? You know, as an entrepreneur, I went to meet the director general of the tax. When I meet him, I get his organization chart. And I understood he has six deputy director generals. And I want to meet each of them. When I meet each of them, I get the names and the telephone numbers of the next two layer managers. And then I invited all of them to a meeting room, and I prepared a presentation telling them, who am I? What did I do? Why I came to the country? What am I planning to do? Most importantly, the problem I have encountered. And afterwards, I invited all of them to the production floor, seeing from the beginning to the end. And then everything is rosy. So you probably want to ask me, Helen, why did you take so much effort to do this, you know, in Ethiopia? I tell you, actually, there's a big information asymmetry. Before I came to Africa, what do I know? I would say war, disease, corruption, and safari. That's all I know from BBC and CNN. But when I went there, I see a different perspective of Africa. I remember my first trip, before I even made the decision to invest, I went out on the rural trip with some ministers, and we saw some children suffering from hunger. So on behalf of the company, I wrote a check of 100,000 US dollars. I gave it to the minister. I said, please take this money to buy some food for those poor children on the street. You know what happened? The minister looked at the check for a minute, and he returned it to me. He said, Helen, I don't want fish from you. I want you to teach us how to catch the fish. And this actually is make me making the decision to invest in that country. And last to close, you know, um, I want to share a personal story. During my first visit uh, back in 2011 to Ethiopia, I stayed in Sheraton Hotel in Hadis Ababa. Maybe some of you also stayed there. It's a beautiful hotel full of roses. So after a day, seeing what I've seen, I'm digesting, you know, the food after dinner, walking along the garden. And suddenly I hear some music. So I follow the music. I went to the back of the hotel. And then I find there's a bar called Office Bar. And I looked around. I'm seeing there's a lot of foreigners singing and dancing in the bar. I didn't see any locals, which reminds me of a personal story 30 years ago. When I was seven years old, at that time, in China, there's only one five-star hotel in Beijing called Beijing Hotel. Because it is my birthday, my father wanted to give me a treat. So he took me to the hotel. And then in the reception, he asked, how much is it per night? Because he wanted us to stay there. That's 30 years back. And the reception told my father, 100 US dollars. My father immediately said, that is too expensive for us. So he was taking me, that little girl, away from that beautiful Beijing Hotel in China. The moment I said, little girl, I was leaving the lobby, I turned my head back. I look at the lobby. I didn't see any Chinese except the waiters and waitress. I'm seeing foreigners, you know, enjoying their luxury life. At that moment, I thought, that is a world that does not belong to me. That is a world probably never belonged to me. But then my life changed dramatically in the last 30 years. It's nothing to do with how good I am. It is because my country find the right path of development. So for me, the moment when I was in that Sheraton Hotel, seeing in that office bar, seeing the foreigners singing and dancing, what went through to my mind is, outside the big gate of Sheraton, there must be a lot of young girls thinking exactly like me 30 years back. In their mind, inside the big gate of Sheraton, that is a world that does not belong to them. 
And maybe that's a world will never belong to them. But what they don't know is, if their country can find the right path of development, their life will change dramatically. So in summary, I want to say I'm a strong believer in Africa. I believe strong leadership, sustainable commitment, and successful examples. I'm looking forward to working with all of you to move from vision to action, dreams to reality. Thank you all.